Welcome to the MindSee podcast series, Moving Digital Health. Our guest today is Bill Winkenwerder. Bill is a physician and prominent American healthcare industry leader. Currently, he is the chairman and CEO of Winkenwerder Strategies, where he works with global private equity firms such as Bain Capital, EQT, Carlisle Group, and Partners Group and healthcare companies such as Sidious Tech and Confluent Health to transform the trajectory of healthcare nationwide. Thank you for joining us today, Bill. Ruben, great to be with you. Uh, could you start off by telling us a bit about your background? Uh, happy to do that. I trained uh, initially as a primary care physician, uh, attended medical school at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where I grew up in the state of North Carolina. Uh, did a residency in internal medicine that sort of prepares you for general medicine. And, and then I went beyond that uh, after all those years of training and had an interest in what we now call population health, e- epidemiology, biostatistics, sort of the looking at the broader picture instead of just a one-on-one patient care. Mm-hmm. And that led me to, uh, to, uh, uh, apply and then attend at the University of Pennsylvania, the Wharton School of Business, and also a fellowship program there that was focused on that very topic of epidemiology, biostatistics, clinical health research, that kind of thing. And uh, that was a, a key pivot point early in my career because it was you know, pretty different than just taking care of patients. Uh, which I like to do, but it was uh, it pointed me in a different direction, and I spent three years there, uh, two two year programs that uh, combined them, did it three years, and then immediately after that I had an opportunity to kind of jump into the policy world, and was offered uh, a job to work as the assistant to what we now call CMS, the big federal agency that runs Medicare and Medicaid, mm-hmm. and spent a couple of years there. Uh, running uh, or working with the leadership and introducing some ideas that I had picked up in those last few years about population health and measuring health outcomes and so on and so forth. Um, I then uh, pivoted back into clinical practice and uh, a primary care physician became a medical director, the chief medical officer, uh, and I was in in Atlanta, Georgia at the time with Kaiser Permanente and mm-hmm. also Emory University Health System. Um, that led to another opportunity to uh, sort of move up the ladder, so to speak, with a health plan, which was Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts, where I was recruited in to uh, become the chief operating officer there. And, uh, you know, uh, be at that interface dealing with between the health insurer and large healthcare provider systems. Mm-hmm. And, uh, that was a, that was a very interesting, great experience. Some very, uh, leading minds in healthcare there in the Boston area during those years. And certainly, uh, still today, I, uh, I then left there and had an opportunity to return to government and, uh, took on the responsibility of running all the healthcare, leading the healthcare for the U S military health wow. system. And uh, that was uh, right after 9-11. So uh, I, that was uh, not uh, something I expected. I actually uh, joined or was asked to uh, sign on and uh, work as an appointee of then President George W. Bush uh, was sort of waiting to hear about being confirmed by the Congress to take on that job when 9-11 happened. So it really changed my my career yet again to, to yeah. jump into the middle of uh, military and national security issues and uh, global health care and so on and so forth. And I spent six years there, uh, had quite an experience, all kinds of things. We could talk just about that, but um, but it would it immersed me at that time as I had uh, in the years prior to that in digital health. And because there was a lot of resources there to, you know, introduce at that time, the early, the early electronic health record systems. Okay. And, uh, yeah. And so was involved in that at the Department of Defense. And we 
coordinated our efforts with the VA, uh, which is a different agency, different department, and also help sort of um, establish a foothold in the federal government for investment uh, and policy in digital health care with the stand up of the Office of the National Coordinator for Health Information Technology. It's now, you know, short, short name now is ONC. But uh, that was the agency that after I left um, government uh, uh, appropriated $30 billion uh, to promulgate and accelerate the adoption of electronic health records. That was right in the 2011, 2010, 2011, 2012 time period. That was also the time of the introduction of Obamacare. Yeah. And, uh, and by that point in time, I had left the Department of Defense and then took on uh, a role as CEO of Highmark Health, which is one of the 10 largest health systems, sort of combined health insurance and healthcare delivery. Um, I took, took that organization through a lot of changes and restructuring and acquisitions and so forth, ultimately left there and then uh, pivoted yet again uh, for the final phase of my career, I, I think it's final now, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, still doing it, but working with those private equity firms and mm -hmm. uh, investing in healthcare, investing in innovative healthcare organizations that I think are, you know, changing the landscape, improving how, how healthcare is delivered using information, technology, software, et cetera, to improve healthcare. So that's what I do today. And uh, so I chair uh, the board at CityS Tech and very involved in that company and lead director at Confluent Health. I'm also involved uh, at the University back at my alma mater, UNC Healthcare, uh, as their one of their board members and a couple of other companies as well. So uh, I'm, I'm very active, very engaged as much as I've ever been, but it's kind of in a different capacity than being either a clinician or an executive. It's really more on the governance side and on, on the investment side. Okay. So yeah, so many roles and, and so much experience to, to dive into. Obviously you're, you know, still very engaged and passionate. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm wondering, you know, what really drives you about the, you know, the healthcare and digital health space, uh, you know, what gets you excited to, you know, to keep on, uh, uh, you know, working with these companies uh, every day. Yeah. yeah. Well, I get excited by seeing uh, solutions, that is technology solutions that make healthcare better, make it mm -hmm. easier, um, improve it for the patient, improve that, actually improve the outcome and the satisfaction that people have with the care that they're getting. And, um, and I think it's also the use of technology uh, already has in the last 10 or 15 years accelerated the pace of our knowledge. So we're learning more and learning faster mm -hmm. because of all the data. And um, so that kind of supercharges my passion. Um, and I just see lots of different places, lots of different areas that the um, digitization of healthcare can improve healthcare. Now, not everything, obviously, is is a net improvement. There are things that happen that are mistakes and there are, you know, complications and sometimes it doesn't work out the intended way. But all in all, I, I have, have no doubt that we're on a on a pathway uh, that is improving healthcare care um, and making it better. And so I want to keep 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 doing that. Now, I'll say this. Apart from that, you know, it's interesting that we've had along the same timeline trends that say that uh, tell us pretty pretty clearly that the, the actual health of people has has not improved. In fact, in the U.S. Mm -hmm. and many other countries, the health status has declined. So yeah, I think it's important to separate the fact that our healthcare system, I I think, is working in many ways better than it ever has, even though it's very complex. 
and the health of people is not so great. One might ask, why is that? And I think I, I've come to the belief that we can work forever, work really hard, even smartly on improving the care process, but we have to ensure that that people themselves are educated, that they're eating the right foods, that they're not getting obese, uh, mm -hmm. that they're not getting onto drugs and fentanyl and all kinds of other things, opio opioids that, you know, really destroy people's health. And you can help people get better from some of those things, but the best approach is to, you know, not have them happen in the first place. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really good point that, you know, the healthcare system can get uh, better quality of care, more efficient. Uh, but if you're feeding more sick people and uh, sicker people into the, the, the system, uh, you know, that's not really solving the, the problem. That's not so, yeah, it's costing more money. And so, so I, I'm hopeful that we will spend more time in the next decade or two talking about that and not, you know, not, not using it as a, a whipping stick or whatever, uh, you know, to try to, uh, um, denigrate people or their have, you know, but to, it's really about education and helping people understand that they can be healthier if they do certain things and that they, um, you know, they, they should do that. We need to teach that. We need to reinforce it. And uh, we've gotten, I think, uh, gotten away from that. And and so that's mm -hmm. another thing that um, whether it's schools or public educate, you know, things that educate people. But I'd also say there's a role for corporations because sometimes corporations make, you know, they make a lot of money um, incentivizing people into sometimes bad habits whether it's the, you know, food industry, the alcohol, um, uh, previously cigarettes and tobacco, <clears throat> that's less. Yeah, of I'd, I'd say that, you know, uh, mobile phones and, and technology are right up there too. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, yeah, certainly there's, you know, there's a lot of power in, uh, yeah. in having those devices in your pockets and, you know, they can uh, make your life more efficient in terms of all the, the tools and, you know, scheduling yeah. and communication. Uh, but they can be also a, a massive time waster with, you know, people right. spending hours flipping through social media when they could be, uh, you know, out doing other things. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's going to be a tough challenge getting, you know, getting those habits changed. Um, so that they're they're healthier habits that people uh, adopt and uh, that they adopt early on. It becomes part of their lifestyle, you know, for most of their rest of their life. Yeah, for yeah. sure. So I'm wondering, uh, you know, what are some of the biggest lessons you've taken away from, you know, working directly with healthcare leaders uh, yeah. over, over, over your career? Yeah, I think it's important. Uh, no matter what kind of organization you're part of or, you know, what aspect of healthcare you're involved in you know, as a leader, uh, to identify clearly, you know, the vision and, and, and uh, the sort of the where you're going um, and to have a strategy for that and mm -hmm. to pursue it um, very diligently, very persistently to get your, you know, your team, your people engaged in that, you, you have to start with that. If you, if you're not starting with a, with some passion and excitement and vision, you know, it's just not going to be motivating. But secondly, after that, you have to ensure that what you're doing or trying to introduce the new thing, the new solution, the new software, et cetera, that it, it fits into the system right now as it exists. Uh, sometimes I think people get a little bit too carried away with massive transformation. And that's really hard to do massive transformation. Yeah. Uh, or, you know, I mean, you can whale away and criticize uh, till the cows come home, you know, the complexity of the problems of the healthcare system. But 
you're better off to focus on something that you can potentially change, that you can improve and, and, and get that into place and work with, you know, the providers, the business people, the users, the patients, the members, work with the people that are using the system to, to introduce that and build on that. And uh, so that that's that's another thing that I've learned. And I think companies that do that, um, you know, have a much better chance of, of being successful. So it's not, you know, it's not easy. Most of the people that I've worked with that are like CEOs or founders, they're super smart and mm-hmm. they're very passionate. And I like working with them for that reason. Uh, they, you know, they just got a lot of energy, want to change the end. But, you know, another element to not making is, you know, you're always going to make mistakes, but to making fewer mistakes is to gather around you um, and take the advice of people who have more experience so mm-hmm. that you don't, don't make, you know, so many mistakes. And uh, I think that's a really wise thing. I think the companies that tend to grow and succeed and go to that next stage and the stage after that, that's what they do. They, they really find the help and support and guidance from, you know, smart, um, experienced people. And that's where private equity can come in with mm-hmm. not only the money to grow, but bringing in people that really have great experience and can help advise, you know, the, the, the existing management team. Yeah, we work with a lot of founders at MindC, uh, and especially uh, founders who are experts in their field. They may be a, a medical doctor, but they don't really know software and, and technology. Yeah. So, you know, we spend a lot of time, you know, talking people uh, out of, you know, building the everything, building the vision right, right. off the bat and say, okay, let's scale it back. So let's lean it out. What's the smallest thing we can, we can do to test your concept to see right. if that works, uh, get it done as cheaply and quickly as possible, and then iterate from there. Because you're right, the, uh, you know, founders are visionary. They do, they see, you know, a few years into the future of, you know, the fully fledged mature solution and that massive change, but it's, you know, one step at a time. And trying to trying to get founders to walk that back is, is always a tough conversation. Yeah, it is. It's a balancing act. Because you don't want to destroy the passion or the, or the you know, energy. Uh, but at the same time, you know, if it's like driving a car and driving it really fast, you know, it, you're, you're likely to crash, uh, you know, unless you really know what you're doing or you slow down and learn. Yeah, it's a, it's a conversation about that, that risk. How confident, uh, you know, are you in, in your solution or your uh, bet that you're willing to uh, to take that risk, and and some people are okay with that risk and say, yeah. no, I feel 100. percent This is the way to go. Or some people say, no, let's let's test it out first. Let's get some yeah. feedback. Let's uh, let's try and de-risk uh, the the technology before uh, building the everything. Yeah, absolutely, for sure, makes sense. Uh, and so, so with your experience uh, there, are there any kind of you know specific examples or you know case studies you'd, you'd like to share? Um, sure, uh, I'll give uh, I'll give a, a couple, um, and I'll go back to my Department of Defense days, and uh, one of the things, for example, that we did. While I was there, we did several things, but um, with with respect to um, just the way that system was organized, we uh, went through a process to try to consolidate different facilities because in that system, there was the Army, the Navy, the Air Force that each had their own, you know, systems and their Mm -hmm. own facilities. And that may have made sense you know, 50 years ago, but it wasn't the way to do it now and, um, or at that time. And so, uh, we wanted to consolidate some of the big hospitals, especially in the Washington DC area. And, uh, you know, the army and the Navy each had a big facility. 
the Navy at Bethesda, the Army at what was then called Walter Reed. And, uh, but through a series of, you know, pretty intense discussions and efforts, and also there's a, there was a process that was going on at the time called Base Realignment and Closure that was mandated by Congress, which told, which tells the Department of Defense, you, you take, take this period of time for the next couple, two, three years, and come back with a plan of things you want to close, things you want to open, things you want to restructure, because it's so hard to do it in the normal course of business. And what we did was we put the healthcare system changes into that process, which gave us the leverage and the, and the authority to make those big changes. And what came out of that was a consolidated uh, idea of, of combining the Army and the Navy and the Air Force into a single hospital system that is now the system that's there today, the Walter Reed National mm -hmm. Military Medical Center. That's where all the presidents and congressional leaders and so forth get their care. And it's a world-class, you know, it's the best military hospital in the world. And so uh, that that would be an example of, you know, being strategic, but also being aware of the politics and how that can get in the way of, you know, making transformation. Yeah. And how long did that take roughly? Because that, uh, that it sounds like yeah. a, quite a, quite a big change. It was, and just to get the decisions, uh, teed up and made and approved and so forth was about a two year process. And then there was like a three, four year timeline after that for all the construction and and uh, tear down and build up and all that stuff that followed. So it all in, all in, it was probably, you know, six or seven years, long time. And, yeah. uh, but that's how you make big, big changes. And then I would say, you know, in the area of digital health, um, we, we introduced um, at that time, one of the early versions of electronic health records, uh, as did the VA. And I think it was what we were doing at that time uh, got the notice of people in Washington and the president and the White House and various other people. And they said, should we do more and should we do more, uh, you know, as a as a government? And we, we advised, yes, we should. So uh, a new office was established to promulgate uh, electronic health records and digital health. That was the Office of the National Coordinator. And then that actually had bipartisan support. And then after the Bush administration, the Obama administration took that up and put all that money behind it, behind the adoption. And uh, and that's made it, you know, obviously this made a huge change in healthcare mm -hmm. in the United States, really probably in the world. Um, and it was, you know, $30 billion, a lot of money, but in the grand scheme of things, not that much to incentivize. Now, somebody asked me recently, was there any mistake that they made? And I, I said, yeah, I think they did make some mistakes on that, even though we got the good you know, outcome from that. But what was not in that uh, legislation and those policies was the establishment of things like interoperability um, and systems talking to each other and creating common standards. So Unfortunately, there was a lot of adoption of different systems and mm -hmm. they couldn't talk to each other. And now we're only beginning to solve that problem, you know, the last few years, still not solved. But we're doing that, you know, with cloud infrastructure and with interoperability standards and mandates on interoperability. And um, so I, and then now, of course, we're going to be driven, I think, by generative AI and chat GPT and, and these things that are going to get in, introduced that will, you know, bring even more change uh, to, to the future of healthcare. So, yeah, certainly you, you highlighted interoperability as, uh, as being a big challenge still to, to overcome and, you know, understanding yeah. that's, that's progressing uh, and taking time. 
Uh, are there any other you know big gaps in the digital health uh, you see in the U.S. Yeah. that uh, still need to be uh, crossed? Yeah, absolutely. A couple of the areas that I see that are really still problematic is the workflow inside of hospitals and even inside of clinics. There's still um, a lot of paper, a lot of reliance on fax and and phone and machines now i'm not a uh, anti-phone person i think people, <laughs> talking to, people talking to each other is a good thing but there is a lot that can be done uh to automate many of those processes in the you know supply chain all kinds of stuff and uh that's where a lot of labor costs are and so, yeah, that would probably eliminate some jobs, but you know, net net, it would make make things more efficient. I think that another area is the documentation. There's sort of a imperative that's uh, been established to document everything, and uh, because we can, we don't always use all that information. There's a ton of it that gets collected, but the collection part is. You know, that that consumes time and it consumes energy, especially uh, on the front end with with clinicians Mm -hmm. uh, spending a lot of their time. So I'm hopeful, again, that that uh, generative AI and some of the new um, technology there can can help uh, reduce that workload because it's kind of mundane work that's really not, you know, you know, it's 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 it's. It, it, it prevents the clinicians from working at their, you know, at their full grade level, so to speak. Mm-hmm. So I think that. And then thirdly, I'd say on the patient and consumer side, I think there's a lot more that can be done to uh, give the patient, the consumer, the health plan member, uh, the option, the flexibility, the ability to do things like make appointments, uh, you know, track and and move their records um engage you know to get guidance for care all of that i think that you're going to see more of that uh happening online and i think that's a good thing um it 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 can it can take time but i think i think that's another area that i see a gap and opportunity and then finally i'd say in the area of analytics and just data uh, that can help accelerate the um, research on new care pathways and new care approaches and new drugs, and new devices. All of that can be done more quickly and more efficiently using information technology. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of the, the work we've been doing recently is on the research side as well. So I think uh you know mobile phones and specifically connected to uh to wearables like watches are gathering a whole bunch of health data including uh heart rate you know activity uh and being able to you know collect accurate data for research purposes uh is a great way to to get insights on uh you know population behavior and health yeah absolutely and it does come back to you know again, individuals having the ability um, to use that information to adjust and, and change what, what they're doing and, you mm-hmm. know, better self-care um, protocols and better self-care uh, activity. But again, it goes, it goes, back, uh, it goes back to the, the, the idea that we talked about earlier, which is individuals can have a, a huge uh, impact on their own health, you know, but they need to do certain things uh, in order to do that. And it doesn't all, you know, doesn't have to be like, uh, you know, you're being instructed by your third grade teacher, you know, to do this. I mean, it's like, you know, just, just, just do what, what, what makes sense and what's <laughs> good and, and stay away, stay away from the bad stuff, you know. And it'll make a big difference in in your life and the quality of your life. And more people need to need to know that they can they can have an impact uh, by following these uh, 
appro better approaches for healthy living. Yeah, and, and digital health tools can really help uh, support them doing that. But, yeah. uh, you know, you're right. There needs to be that, you know, that motivation to uh, um, to improve your health to start off with. Yeah. Uh, and the whole, you know, you can lead a horse to water. But uh, yeah. um, and, and I think to your point before, the education plays a big part in, you know, understanding that, you know, it's it's important to to take that role in, uh, in, in your own health. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So it's been, um, you know, a really fun and interesting uh career for for me it's not obviously not over but uh i uh i've met so many uh brilliant people uh people that are uh doing really interesting things uh helping to change healthcare, uh helping to change you know society so mm -hmm. uh, a, a long list of really uh accomplished and interesting and uh game changing people. And that's been a that's been another aspect of all of this. It's been just, you know, very rewarding to uh to be engaged with. Yeah, and you and you mentioned, you know, being able to be part of the the team that uh, brought about the Walter Reed Hospital. Uh certainly you can feel really good about that. Is there anything else you can look and back on and uh you know think about like, you know, where your biggest impact, uh, yeah. has been. Well, I, it, there, there are a few different things, uh, you know, at least in, in my own mind, um, uh, I, uh, I, you know, the things I'm engaged with right now are, are, are still growing. I mean, they're still in a full growth flower flowering growth stage. Cities tech, for example, when I got involved with, with the company, it was, it's a software health, totally focused on healthcare software services company. So think of them as a company that supplies the people to help healthcare institutions build their technology, their technology stack and helps mm -hmm. in areas of whether it's, um, you know, uh, their, their existing systems or new systems or changing and so software engineering, data analytics, AI, ML, uh, performance, metrics, all of that. And we work with all sectors of healthcare, payers, providers, life sciences, med, med tech companies. Mm -hmm. But when I got involved with the company eight years ago, we were about 60 million in revenue and we'll be over half a billion this year. Oh, and, wow. You know, so it's a fast growing company and backed by uh, two of the biggest uh, private equity firms in the world. And, uh, you know, so you, you just feel like you're, you're riding a, a fast running horse that's, uh, you know, gonna keep going. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so that, that's very exciting. And uh, then I work with another company that's a physical therapy company that's, uh, I think, really changing the definition of physical therapy to, think of it more as a musculoskeletal um, <laughs> service platform. So whether it's, it's not just the rehab, it's the prehab, it's the prevention at workplaces, it's digital uh, physical therapy. It's a bunch of different things. When you put them together, the idea is that you can create a, you know, more of a value-based care approach instead of just, you know, get a referral from a doctor, go see a physical therapist. It's really ex an expanded view uh, and with the idea that that uh, our, our customers or our, our company itself might be in a position to, you know, take some financial risk for a population of people because you can do all those things for them and, uh, you know, deliver better, services and better outcomes at a lower cost mm -hmm. that's um so I, I those those are just a couple of examples that are exciting to me that i see as being you know game-changing companies for the next five to ten years 
Yeah, we did uh, uh, a mobile app that's uh, currently in a, in a research study uh, with uh, Sunnybrook Research Institute uh, mm -hmm. about physiotherapy and specifically uh, rehab exercises. The app gives the patient, you know, videos and detailed instructions, you yes. know, walking them through those exercises, which really helps with adherence because right. uh, it's a big part of the challenge there. Uh, but we're also collecting a lot of the, the data off a of smartwatch as they're doing the exercises mm. to give the clinicians information about uh, how they're performing uh, against their baselines. Um, so some really interesting opportunities uh, there in the physiotherapy space for sure. Yeah, you got it. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's uh, kind of a quick summary of things and uh, appreciate the appreciate the opportunity to talk and, and, and field your questions. And uh, you're obviously very, uh, very knowledgeable about this whole space. So yeah, well, it's yeah. been a pleasure chatting with you, Bill. Uh, and thanks for joining me on the podcast. And uh, thanks everyone for listening as well to Moving Digital Health. Uh, if you enjoyed the conversation, please go to movingdigitalhealth.com to subscribe to the Mind Season newsletter and be notified about future episodes.